It's not about effort level, it's about this inner belief. Can deep down the reason she or he or whoever it is, the person who's listening to this episode, the reason they're not giving their best is because deep down they don't believe that they can achieve what they're going after. And so it, for their, their ego can't take that. Why am I gonna give my best when I'm still gonna fail? I'm, what, I'm, I'm gonna look like a loser. So deep down, they're not gonna try their hardest because it's uh, at least they can convince themselves, oh, I didn't give my best. Welcome back to the Cannonball Mindset. And I'm in uh, Bradenton, Florida, which is, isn't this like the, the, the uh, home of every baseball team spring training was that a lot of them. <laughs> there are a lot of there. There was a lot of baseball players and, uh, and and teams around this area. In this area, right? Well, I'm sitting in Bradenton, <laughs> Florida, with Justin Sua, who is the mental performance coach for the Tampa Bay Rays. Correct. Not Devil. Take the Devil out. Yes. Now Tampa Bay Rays. And he also has an incredible, incredible podcast that goes out every single morning. Increase your impact. And this is awesome because I follow you. You're you're like your Instagram presence, your uh, social media presence is really very quick and uplifting. Like you can read these like bite-sized nuggets and you're like, Ooh, I really like that. I, I constantly, I am constantly looking at it. My director of operation, uh, her name is Morgan. She is addicted to your morning podcast oh, and your morning awesome. to every morning around, uh, you know, seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning. I can, I know that if I look at your Instagram account and then her Instagram account. It's always the exact same because she takes yours <laughs> she and she forwards it and puts it awesome. on her story. I have to thank her for that. <laughs> yeah, she's she's a huge fan. She's a uh, huge cool. fan. But a mental health, mental performance coach for uh, a lot of professional athletes. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Grateful to be here. Thanks for inviting me. This is going to be uh, just a great conversation because I think one of the things I really, uh, I really liked about you and your message is that you you had said at some point, whether it's on a podcast, maybe it's the phone call you and I had, you work with the tip of the spear, tip of the spear uh, performers. Yes. And I think we had a great conversation around, well, is is excellence and is is that type of performance, is that reserved when people say elite, these elite athletes, is elite only for these special few that were born with this DNA to be elite or is that a a learned behavior? Is that a learned mindset? That's a great question. I think elite is, it's reserved for anybody. Anyone could be elite in terms of what they do. And there's an elite version of ourselves. If I were to sit down with a person and whether it be an elite athlete who's performing at the highest level or a WWE wrestler or, or an insurance agent, agent, I would ask it, what does the elite version of you look like? And uh, it is something that uh, identifying who you are, identifying your why and what high performance habits you need to adopt and to execute to be at the best version of yourself. I, I think it's something that we, we could all embrace and all develop into. So, so that's, I love that answer. And, and so, so I think most people have, have a hard time digesting that. Yeah. And, and I think they have a hard time digesting it because I think most people want to want to be elite but they they say things like it's not in my cards it's not i just wasn't born with that dna you know yeah i have different the circumstances weren't in my favor and they idolize other people when the reality is if they if they saw them saw that they have elite elite uh potential inside themselves it seems like it's much more achievable. Is that right? I agree. I agree. And, I, and I've heard what you just said, uh, just kind of when people balk at that. No, it's, it's only reserved for the few. It's only reserved for the best of the best. You were touched with the ability to be great at whatever you do. But when you sit down with these elite performers, they'll tell you how hard they had to work to get where they are. They'll tell you the road that they that they had to pave and the obstacles they had to overcome and the, the hours and hours of pounding at their craft they had to do in order to be considered one of the best in the world at whatever they do. And I think it really comes down to, uh, there's great research out there uh, talking about this. Uh, Carol Dweck's work, I'm not sure if you're oh, familiar yeah. with it, uh, right. Fixed and Growth Mindset. Now, uh, the, the the term is called implicit theories. Basically, it's this notion that 
you're either fixed or you're growth. Do you have a fixed mindset where you don't believe you can change or this growth mindset where you believe you're a work in progress, you are under construction. And there's, there's essentially five basic categories that differentiate between these, this fixed mindset and growth mindset person. And, and if someone's listening to this and they're thinking, okay, I want to be elite. The first thing that I would ask you is, okay, number one, what's your, what's your relationship with failure? How do you view it? Is it something that is it defines who you are and is devastating, or is it something that you learn from? Uh, the next one is obstacles. How do, how do you view obstacles? Is it something you try to avoid and you want to stay in your safe zone because you're afraid of failing, or are you willing to embrace the hard things and step outside your comfort zone? And then effort level. Do you only give your best when you feel like it? Do you only go work out when when you when you're well rested, or or do you do what you need to do to be successful even when you don't? aren't successful or when you read the writing on the wall that you're not going to achieve your goals, you still give your best efforts. Mm -hmm. And then critical feedback. Uh, are you, do you avoid critical feedback? Do you put your head in the sand and, 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 mm -hmm. and only want people to tell you how great you are and to build you up? Or are you looking for someone who's going to help you be better instead of feel better? And then finally the success of others. Now, are you, do you get jealous or threatened when others succeed or are you inspired and do you, do you watch them and, and try to find the clues to their success and adopt them to your own. And so that's something that if you want to be elite, I would really first talk about uh, developing and, and embracing the growth mindset, knowing that you can change and you can evolve and, and you can be the best version of yourself. Yeah, I love that. And I think that, you know, I want to get to how you got to be this mental performance coach and this, this, uh, this uh, Sherpa for people on their, on their, on their <laughs> yeah. journey, right? But, 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 but I want to talk a little bit about that, but what you just said before I get there. So I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday and they said, ah, just, I just, I just wish my daughter would, would try harder, would try yeah. harder. Right. And I think this is a, this is a, uh, and I want to get your take on this and you may have a, just a different point of view, but I'm like, I don't think, I don't think she's capable of trying harder. I think sometimes we say try harder is like a, is a, is just something that we think, well, if we just work harder, everything falls in place. But for, for this person, it's this person, this, this person who's struggling, they have a governor. If you, if you relate it to their car, they have a governor on their car and they can only go 60 miles an hour. And it doesn't matter how hard they press on that gas pedal, they're only going to go 60 miles an hour. And the governor is this mindset that you have. And until you remove the governor yourself, it doesn't matter how hard you work. Is that right? I'm saying you can have all the effort in the world, but if you, if there's a governor on you, Exactly. There are so many variables to that, to that mantra, to the axiom, try harder. A lot of times you said it as a parent, you'll look and you'll see, oh, I wish my child tried harder. I wish, I wish they put in more effort. I wish they were more motivated where the reality, it could be a number of different, it's so nuanced. It might be, they don't even want to do it. It might be your goal, mom, or your goal, dad, and they don't even want to do it. The reason they're not trying hard is because they don't love it like you do. They don't see the value in it. Uh, it might be they uh, they they lack focus. It might be just their their uh, focus situation. It might be resilience. Uh, they lack resilience, the ability to be able to bounce back or to learn from failure. It could be a number of different things. They just might not have a good relationship with mom and dad, where everything you're trying to tell your kid is bouncing off their forehead because. They don't want to listen to you and, and maybe bringing in an outside voice and, and that person who could convey the message to them to help them out, maybe that will help. Maybe the situation isn't conducive to their learning. Maybe they struggle with the environment or the coach or the teammates. Uh, there could be a number of different things, but you're right. It, a lot of times it's not about effort level. It's about this inner belief. Can deep down the reason she or he or whoever it is the person who's listening to this episode, the reason they're not giving their best is because deep down, they don't believe that they can achieve what they're going after. And so it, it, for their, their ego can't take that. Why am I going to give my best when I'm still going to fail? I'm, I'm, I'm going to look like a loser. So deep down, they're not going to try their hardest because it's uh, at least they can convince themselves, oh, I didn't give my best. Yeah, that's best I why I didn't that. succeed. So, so, so the first step is, and, and again, I'm a big fan of Carol Dweck and um, but the first step is is really understanding that you're capable of growing. Of your that you is, is awareness. Like I have to go from unconsciously incompetent to consciously incompetent in the sense of now I know there's a deficit. Like I know I can do it, but until until you lift that veil, nothing happens. Exactly. Right? Uh, you can't change what you're not aware of, yeah. and that level of self awareness, truly understanding who you are, 
what your character strengths are. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Uh, how do you, what's your relationship with like success? What's your relationship like with failure? Taking a look in a hard look in a mirror and knowing that you might have to ask other people outside of you to give you really difficult feedback, but who also care about you? Yeah. That's not just going to be any random person. Uh, that is the first step to really identifying and seeing, oh, Taking, seeing what steps you need to take in order to be elite and to be great at what you do. Yeah, I love that. And so, so let's talk about how. So, so you're a mental performance coach with the professional sports team. You Correct. were with some football teams. Probably you were with the football Correct. team prior to this, right? Correct. The Cleveland Browns. Um, and now you're now you're baseball, but athletes and athletes and mindset is mindset, right? Right. So right. It, it, it probably wouldn't matter if you were with the. Raise if you're with the Browns or if you in with the NBA basketball team. Athletes, athletes, people, people, mindset, mindset. Is that, Correct. Is that yes, correct? that that there are there are a couple di variables or differences. For example, a PGA golfer who is by himself, or a boxer, or an MMA fighter who's by themselves in the ring or the cage on a course is different than someone who plays a team sport. Uh, age could matter, experience could matter, um, and then even just the the situation of performance. So I've worked with with insurance agents, I've worked with auditors, I've worked dancers on Dancing with the Stars, and so <laughs> understanding the context of performance is critical to knowing how to best help these these performers um, not even necessarily athletes but also uh, just just knowing that athletes don't have the corner market on stress uh, they don't have the corner market on performing under pressure or or being having to show up the best version of yourself i'm i've noticed as i work in different domains like yourself working with people around the world you see that there are very there are commonalities between athletes and moms and dads and golfers and butchers and insurance agents it's all um, it, it, everyone's trying to be their best when it matters most why do you think it why do you think uh let me it wasn't until recently and, and i want to say recently and maybe i'm wrong with the years but within the last maybe uh, five to ten years that these uh sport that sports teams started started hiring mental performance coaches they normally would reserve them just for psychologists which is different right. you have a degree in sports psychology right. psychologists completely different right but the why is it that, that teams started realizing and understanding that hey you know what we have to we have to we have to get people in the right uh, state of mind if we want to get the right output yeah i think just in the evolution of sports in general particularly we'll just talk about the the, the tip of the spear the elite performers we're we're seeing this trend in how do we optimi op uh, optimize these athletes in every aspect? So early on in sport, we'll go baseball, for example. Uh, it used to be the point to where it was just coaches. The coaches did everything. They were the strength and conditioning coaches. They were the athletic trainers. They were the, they were the sports psychologists. They were everything. And then all of a sudden, they started to introduce athletic trainers back in the, I can't remember exactly what decade it was. And then all of a sudden, here comes strength and condition conditioning coaches. And then here came nutritionists. And then here came, and now we are seeing this explosion of mental performance coaches uh, coming in to help these, these athletes perform at their absolute best. And I think you're seeing it particularly with Olympians and with elite athletes is because so much is on the line. And when you sit down and you talk to these athletes, hey, what percent of your sport is mental? And they say a number like 90 to 95, and then you ask 90 to 95%, and then you ask them, okay, how often are you working on the mental side of your sport? And You'll see blank stares and think zero i'm not really working on it and so having this group of professionals come in to help them articulate to help them put a handle on on these seemingly esoteric concepts uh to be able to provide these athletes that help them label things they're already doing really well so that they can do them on purpose mm -hmm. with purpose i'm i think we're seeing this explosion and i think sports are saying oh baseball's doing it so now football started to have it and then basketball starting to have it and and you did mention the difference between performance psychology and mental health and clinical psychology which is which is in, an important di uh, different uh, different what's the word differentiator uh, di differentiator yeah between yeah. the two um it comp they're they're different there are there is some overlap but um <laughs> but yeah we have trained mental health specialists to help them through the dark times as well yeah i think this is really important to understand because you know i think that this is, again, we're using sports as kind of the vehicle to wrap this conversation around, but, but the same struggles that the tip of the spear athletes or these professional athletes, right, mm -hmm. that, that they have, they can be the same mental roadblocks and struggles that 
a working mom may have or that yeah. that I have as a business owner or that Evan may have as a, as a you know a video guy I'm saying all of this stuff it's the same thing so is that to, would that mean that most people would benefit from having a mental performance coach well you know it's 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 interesting you hit the nail on the head they people would be surprised sometimes to see these this fearless elite athlete on TV who you think, wow, she has so much confidence or wow, he's so on top of the world to, it'd be, it, they'll be intrigued to know that, hey, they, they have very difficult days. They're afraid about what people, they, they care about what other people think. <laughs> they are up at night looking at their Instagram and, and are heartbroken because of all the mean things people are saying to them. They have home lives uh, that, that are, that have been difficult, parents who are struggling and and their heart breaks for their siblings, all of these things as well. And so uh, to say that everyone could use someone, that might be a, that might, I would like to say so, I'm a, yeah. but I'm biased. Yeah. However, I, I see myself and then my colleagues in the same profession, a lot of times we're just, we're mirrors. We're, we're, we're sounding boards for a lot of these, these performers who they don't, they, they want to share things. They might not share it with their families. They might not share with the coach. They might not share with the teammate, but they know they could sit down with a non-judgmental voice um, and a set of ears to, to listen um, and to actively listen and to bounce questions off of them to help them find answers to their own questions. And so I think we could all all use someone. Uh, and I think a lot of us do have someone, maybe yeah. the, the person doesn't have a degree in sports psychology, but we have that go-to person who we could kind of, we trust to, to vent to and to help us sift through difficult situations. Yeah, I love that. And the, the idea that, you know, you had said on uh, at some point on one of the interviews that one of the greatest things you can do as a sports psychologist, as a, as a mental health performance coach, and I think you actually called it, uh, it wasn't mental strength, it was mental flexibility. Yeah. But, but the idea, uh, one of the greatest things you can do is really just ask great questions. And, and what, tell me about that. Like, tell me why that's so important, where it's not just me telling you what to do, which is, which is the easy route, right. which is the easy route. Hey, listen, I, I got a degree in sports psychology. I'm the mental health coach. Just go do this, 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 and this, and you're going to be great. But that's not But that's not what you prescribe, right? That's not what you subscribe to. You are – I don't subscribe to that exactly. And a lot of times, that's a common misconception. I'll get the question, hey, what do you tell this athlete? Oh, this – what do you – what would you tell this athlete? I, and I always come back kind of tongue-in-cheek and, tongue and, and say, nothing. I, I, I'm not – it's not my job to tell people – what to do because everyone is so different. You don't know. People think that I'm just spouting out this, these, these inspirational quotes that you see on Twitter, on Instagram. It's, it's, it's so much more complex than that. And so I truly believe that if you want better answers, start asking yourself better questions. And I think a lot of people, when they struggle, they'll ask themselves, a limiting question, self in, uh, self sabotaging questions. Why am I so bad? Why do I struggle so much? Why am I not as good as him or as good as her? And when you ask yourself those questions, our mind is way more powerful than Google. It's going to go out there and it's going to give you evidence to the answer. It's going to tell you why you're bad, why you struggle, why you're terrible. So instead of asking yourself those questions, my job becomes how do I ask a more effective question to help the person sitting knee to knee with me change their view? How do I help them change their perspective and find their own answers. Yeah. So maybe instead of why are they so bad is, hey, what's working, what's not working? Hey, what's something you can learn from this? How can this situation make you stronger? To help them cultivate, like you said, that, that mental flexibility, the situation won't change. The situation is exactly the same, but can we change the way you look at the situation so that you can be in a better headspace to be able to act and to respond more effectively as opposed to the self victimization um, and feeling sorry for ourselves. Yeah, I love it, and I have I have like a, a plethora of questions I want to get just from <laughs> okay. that little little thing you just said. The first is the this idea of um, how you're asking questions. And I, I was really I was really focusing on what you were saying, and I think you started off by saying a lot of people ask themselves these why based questions. And I just gave a talk about this on Monday, where the, just the the format in which we ask questions will change the answer. So why is this? Why is it? It's a very defensive question. When you start a question with why, it, 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 I'm, it's called the blamer question, right? I'm looking to blame somebody, something, right? Find fault. Yeah. But every question you just asked started with what and how. And what and how are collaborative questions. Like it forces you, instead of saying, uh, why am I so bad at this? It's uh, 
what could I do different next time? Now it becomes a learning opportunity. So is it, does, it, is it, does that matter? Does it matter the, the format and the questions you ask yourself? Because it's going to change the answer you get. I loved how you articulated that. I agree wholeheartedly. Yes, it does yeah. matter. And I don't think I can explain it as well as you just did. <laughs> but it's true, right? Like, yes, it's like, true. Like it's I, true. I, have, I have twin daughters, and I realized that I kept asking them questions. I would say, so why didn't you get your homework done? Or why did this happen? And I was asking questions that was going to put them in a state of defense, which means I was going to get a defensive answer back, right. which doesn't lead to anything. Right. But when I changed the questions I asked, the answers started to change. When I started saying, hey, what can we do to do this? What, what, can, we, what can we do better here? What's the, all of a sudden, I started getting collaborative answers back. So I, we have to start by asking ourselves, like you said, better questions. Yes. And, and so that we can get better answers. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that, so, so people don't understand that. I think people want this idea of quick fix, tell me what to do, and I'll do it. But yep. it just doesn't work like that. Exactly. It doesn't. And it, it's, it is so interesting, even as a mom, as a dad, as a boss, we, we have the opportunity to help someone shift their, their, their viewpoint just by asking a, a few better questions. A lot of times it happens all the time where you'll have a child or someone come up to you and say, man, I'm terrible or man, it's such a bad day. And instead of asking, you can ask, why is it a bad day? But you can just even repeat that question back. Oh, it's a bad day. And then they open up a little bit more and then you, oh, really? And yeah. then you open up a little bit more. And as they begin to open up and as they begin to share and, and put things on the table for you, you're going to be able to help them look at their thoughts instead of looking through their thoughts. I Boy, think a lot yeah. of times we have this lens on and we're looking at the world through our thoughts of negativity, our thoughts of doubt. And that's how we, mm. how we code and interpret everything. But as people are able to share and you're able to articulate it bounce and bounce back at them and able to and able to kind of reiterate what they're saying, they're able to look and say, huh, that's interesting I'm looking at it that way. No, I actually don't believe that. And so they're able to look at their thoughts instead of through their thoughts. And so that's another big role that um that I that I do in, in my capacity working with these people and having these conversations one of the things i knew i know you're a fan of um chris voss mm -hmm. right and chris voss yes. has one of the greatest sayings i, I use it in, all the time but uh our job is to get people to trip over the truth yeah and, and that's really seems like what you're doing like i'm gonna ask you a whole bunch of questions i'm gonna have great conversations with you and through that through that discovery through that exploration you're the the truth is going to come upon you and the real truth and you're going to trip over and go ah i got it I yes. got it. I see. I now see things differently. Would that be right? Exactly. I love that tripping over the truth. And a lot of times, the truth is buried in <laughs> negativity in their mind. It's buried in doubt and those limiting beliefs, as as we were talking about earlier. And as you help them sift out and pull out the truth, you can do that through effective questions. Many times it happens all the time where where a person will come up to me, uh, athlete or non-athlete, and and tell me how bad their situation is, how how horrible it is. And it's not our job to to judge them. And it is what it is. This is how they truly feel. And sometimes my very next question is a simple, subtle one, but to help them shift out of that mindset is, all right, great. I'll repeat back everything they just said. And like, yeah, that's not hard. That that's a hard situation, and I'll and I'll, I'll articulate it. Yeah, that's difficult. Now, my question for you is this: So, what are you going to do about it? Mm. Immediately, they'll pause and they'll be like, "Huh, okay, this 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 is what I got to do about it." Just to help them, like you said, trip over the truth and get to focusing on on taking control of the things that they can control, uh, taking control of the things they can control, as opposed to being controlled by the things they can't i love that and so so you had said you had talked about on one of your podcasts that you you work with you work with these elite athletes and these elite athletes somebody had asked you a question about um you know uh, choking and 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 giving like being in the moment and you had a really great way of describing that there's two types of of moments there's two types of uh i forget what you call it but things that things that are matter at that moment and things that don't matter at that moment uh, yeah. in, in the moment. Can you explain that? Yeah. So one of the things about performing at the highest level, there are things called relevant cues and irrelevant that's it. cues. That's it. So, yeah. so relevant cues are the things that matter. So when you're in the zone, for example, and you don't have to be an athlete to be in the zone. We could be in the zone reading a book. We've been in the zone in a conversation with someone where you look at the clock, you're like, wow, we just got done talking for three hours and we were both 
it was a wonderful experience. <laughs> the zone is that moment where you don't care about the judgment of other people, the, the task or the experience itself becomes the reward. You're not worried about the byproduct. You, you're just so focused on the moment. It's called an autotelic experience where the experience is the goal itself. That's the ideal moment when you're so absorbed in a here and now. Now, when you're experiencing that, your sole focus are relevant cues, things that matter, things that are important. Now, when we start to get thrown off our rocker, when all of a sudden we start to get distracted, we begin to focus on things that are irrelevant cues, things that really don't matter. And so these athletes who perform at the highest level, when it matters most at this very acute moment when the pressure is on, they have trained themselves and whether it be consciously or unconsciously, to be so absorbed into this moment right here, right now. They are where their feet are, they're focused on whether it be a certain location where the ball is, they're focused on the snap, all that matters is right here. However, as a fan, we're, as we're watching it, we're focused on other things and sometimes, you'll hear it all the time, where fans are more nervous than the actual player was, <laughs> who's actually performing it. That's because they were trained to focus on the here and now. And so I think we could adopt that to our own lives. And so I would ask someone who's feeling a lot of, a lot of stress right now is, what are the, your relevant cues right now? What are the things that matter most right now? And what are the irrelevant uh, cues or the things that don't matter as much, but you're focusing on those things? And they tend to be things you have absolute no control over. And, and, a, and a thing I, we always talk about is the things that you try to control but can't end up controlling you. And mm -hmm. a lot of times it's when you're feeling that extra tension or that extra stress, ten, you ten, chances are you're focused on things that don't matter, particularly the future or the past. What if I miss? What if I mess up? What's going to happen as opposed to right here, right now? Yeah, I love that. And I think the whole idea of irrelevant cues being, and that would be an example, an example of that would be what? So give me an example of what you mean, like bring that to life for me. Yeah, uh, bring it to life in, in what context? Sports or just? Yeah, sports. Okay, sports. sports. Let's just say baseball. Let's just say baseball. A pitcher's about to throw a pitch. We'll step into the mind of a pitcher. Um, irrelevant cue, uh, a cue is his batting average. An irrelevant cue is the, the, the audience. Irrelevant cue is what are people going to think about me after the game? All of that is irrelevant. My relationship uh, with my wife or my girlfriend or things that that irrelevant really does not matter. Relevant cues are, okay, what is the count right now? Okay, relevant cues is where's a slot? Where, where do I need to pick up the ball out of the pitcher's hands? Uh, relevant cue it might be as simple as, it might be just one thing, relax. It might be a, a word they say themselves, mm -hmm. relax, or see the ball up, see the ball up. And the tighter and the crisper and the cleaner your relevant cue is, the better it is for your mind. Oh yeah, I love that. There was a there's a there's a movie, a Kevin Costner movie called <laughs> yeah. For the Love of the Game, yep, right? Yep. And, I, and I think about this all the time when I'm when I'll go do. I did a, a, a keynote uh, last week, and I think about this almost every time I go on stage. There's a part in the movie where he's like, "Clear the mechanism." Yes. And everything else drowns out. Yes. And all he's focused on is what he's doing and where he needs to perform. And it's, and it's, and I saw, and I saw this live. I saw Tiger Woods play golf once and I got to stand. He was coming down the fairway. The ball landed a couple feet from me and I was on the other side of the ropes and he came up and he was, people were cheering his name. People were looking at him. He came up, he was looking at the shot. And then all of a sudden he had this look on his face. And then I'm saying there were thousands of people there. This is a PGA championship at Whistling Straits. And all of a sudden, I was just, well, I wasn't watching the shot. I was just watching his eyes because I was so mesmerized. I was five feet from him. And it was, looked like he was the only person. Like, he didn't realize anybody else was on that golf course. Is that what you're talking about? That's what I'm talking about. And what's so amazing, going back to what you said earlier, is it's not just reserved for athletes. Yeah. That's not just reserved for Tiger or for Tom Brady or for, or, or for a, a Mike Trout. It's everybody. Imagine being that that worker, that person at work who could, has trained themselves, him or herself, to be able to quiet their mind right before a presentation, to be able yeah. to, to be able to be present right before giving feedback or receiving feedback, yeah. a performance interview, or right before uh, that difficult phone call or that email that you have to respond to that you didn't like the tone, but you're not really sure, wait, are they mad at me? Being able to give yourself and have tools for yourself to go to, to be able to clear the mechanism. And so yeah. that right there, it's really teaching yourself how to 
think on purpose with purpose, how to do what you do on purpose with purpose, creating habits or routines to put your mind and your body in the right place, in the right state. I'm telling you, I love this so much. I work with salespeople all over the country and it, they, that's what happens. I'm telling you, they, they, they get in the moment and they start worrying about what if I don't get the sale for what if this doesn't happen? And the person is standing in front of them that they need to sell, that they need to, that they need to sh- convince. And they're, they're, now understanding your terminology they're worried about all these irrelevant cues that don't matter which is affecting their presence with that customer which then obviously affects the end result correct exactly it's incredible how you can physically be here but mentally you could be in the future or your head could be in the past and and when that's the case you're not showing up the best version of yourself and and just understanding that being aware of that and noticing okay what are my tendencies and I love to do this, going back to that concept of looking at your thoughts instead of through your thoughts, to, dis- to to break that down. Hey, when you start to feel pressure, where does your mind go? And we'll have athletes and for people write that down. Okay, my mind goes here, just so that they're aware. Because a lot of times when you're aware of your weaknesses, when you're aware of your tendencies under stress, your mind, you're going to activate the, the prefrontal cortex of your brain and it's going to scan your environment and it's going to notice. It's going to be, oh, you're starting to get off track. And then to be able to train yourself to get back on track is incredibly yeah. helpful. And again, it, it, sales professionals, uh, auditors, it could be for anybody. And they've learned this. I, listen, I, I, I'm watching. I'm watching Tiger's eyes. He's in. He's clearly cleared the mechanism. There is. Yes. I'm, I've never. I have to this day. I'm 46 years old. 46 years old. I've never seen anybody more deliberately focused in a moment than I saw him go from walking up the ferry, waving to people, saying hi, to deliberately focused and then he hits the shot and then he's like normal like he's normal right. again it's like, All right, hey thanks appreciate it and just starts talking to his cat eating a sandwich or walking down the fairway exactly like that's that's and so how so knowing that right how do you train yourself to get to that exactly point? so first it's you described a very important thing knowing that our focus or our concentration or attention control it's it's a spectrum you got to turn it up sometimes and you can turn it down sometimes and so you have to identify the moments in your performance we'll just talk about performance in general when you have to have when you can have low focus when you could have medium focus and then when it's really high you need to be absolutely locked in so for example in golf High is, 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 I don't know when the clock starts for Tiger, but I imagine, it, or any PGA golfer, I imagine it starts while they're going through their, their warm up. So it's, it's very, okay, boom, it's high, or they're, they're, they're taking a look at the shot, they're, the, the, temp, uh, uh, the wind speed, talking to their caddy, looking at the, uh, uh, where it lies, how distance, so they're focused. And then all of a sudden, the closer they get to the moment when they're gonna hit that shot, it gets sharper and sharper and sharper. And right when the ball leaves the club, boom, okay, they can tone it down a little bit. Because yeah. a lot of people think they have to be focused all the time. And that's just exhausting. That's, yeah. dra- that's draining. So to really look at your life and your career, whatever you do, when do you really need to lock in and be fully present? Now, that's the first part. Identify, okay, when are my high, medium, low parts of focus? Really focusing on the high. And then the other concept is, here's the analogy I love to give. A lot of people will come up to me and they'll, they'll tell me like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm telling myself to focus or I'm telling myself to relax, but it's not working. I'm still unfocused or I still don't have, I'm not relaxed. And the analogy I give them is imagine taking a dog and I don't know if you guys, do you guys have a dog? Yep. Oh, you do? Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, what kind of dog? I have labs. Okay. So you have labs. So imagine one of your dogs and let's just say one of them is full of energy and just untrained. So untrained, and let's say we take, what's the name of one of them? Maggie. Let's take Maggie out into an open field. And let's say Maggie is so untrained that that she's pulling you, can't wait to get off the leash. You have been at my house. Right, right. <laughs> let's say you take Maggie off the leash, untrained, full of energy, where is Maggie going in this, in, if we're on the field? Oh. Everywhere. She's gone. Oh, yeah, and, and it is. Yeah, yeah that's exactly so you're, right. You're yelling at her, get back, sit, stay. But in this instance, Maggie doesn't listen to you, not because she's a disobedient bad dog, but because she's untrained. She doesn't know any better. Now, let's take Maggie, this trainer. Now she's incredibly, incredibly obedient. So we're going to take the same dog on the same leash to the same field, but now she's trained. Take her off the leash. Now, where's Maggie going to go? 
wherever you want her That's to exactly go. Right. Now, the reason is because now she's trained. And so what we tell people is the reason you're not listening to yourself, the reason your body's not listening to you, when you tell it to relax or to focus, it's not because you're mentally weak, it's because your mind's untrained. When you tell yourself to relax, your mind doesn't know what, you haven't trained to be relaxed. When you tell yourself to focus, when have you trained yourself to be focused? Mm. Probably never. So mm. to give yourself, your body and your brain cues on what to do without it being trained, it's not gonna listen to you. So one thing that I would tell you, a person, is to start practicing mindfulness. Start practicing meditation. Just, there's a number of different, there's a lot of research out there, but it's the simplest, uh, most tangible way to exercise and to practice your focus. Mm. To take time to meditate for five, 10, one minute, whatever, and to train your mind, to put your mind where you want, when you want, where you want, when you want. So as you focus on your breath, and then all of a sudden when your mind starts to wander to notice it, and then gently bring it back to your breath, and then do that every day, you're literally training your focus muscle. So that when you're in that heat of the moment, and your mind starts to wander, you can say, bring it back to the breath. Now your mind's gonna listen to you, your attention's gonna listen to you, because it's trained now, yeah. as opposed to if, hey, yeah. get back here, get back here. It's not going to listen. Yeah, such a great analogy. And this is not just psychology. This is the way your brain, I'm saying this is neuroplasticity. At its, as I'm saying you're training, exactly. you're, you're, you're literally training your brain um, to create new neural pathways so that you can bring it back on command. Is that right? Exactly. Building the gray matter in the brain. Nothing builds it quite like meditation. And there's so many benefits uh, to it. And it's, and it's so easy to do that it's easy not to do. Yeah. And a lot of times people are like, oh, I don't, I don't know if it's working. I don't know how to do it. I had one, one player in an NFL, he's a receiver. Um, he comes up to me and he goes, Hey, I want to enhance my focus. I want to be able to bounce back after a draw ball or after a, a missed assignment or a missed route or whatever. And so we started practice mindfulness training. And so he's doing it. And after about four days, he comes back. He's like, I hate it. It's like, what do you mean? He goes, my, I just get distracted. I'm trying to meditate and my mind's going all over the place. And I said, okay, so why are you, why did you initially want to do it? He goes, because my mind's going all over the place. I said, okay, so you're doing the right thing. So it's just like going to the gym. You're not going to be ripped at first. It takes a lot of practice. So he loves going to the gym. So I gave him a, a, a bicep curl analogy. So I said, imagine holding a, a dumbbell and every time you bring it to you, uh, you, you, you pull it up, that, that represents your focus. You're centered on your brain. And then all of a sudden, when you pull it away, that means it's getting away from you. And then you bring it back, and then you, you get distracted, then you bring it back, and you get distracted. So what's going to happen to my bicep if I keep doing that? Immediately it clicked. He goes, yeah. it's going to get stronger. I said, yes. Every time you lose focus and you gently bring it, you're aware of it, and then gently bring it back to your breath, there's a rep. Yeah. You're getting more reps, and you're getting better at doing it. Lo and behold, he goes and he continues to do it. And um, when he comes back, he's like, yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting better at it. But again, it's all qualitative analysis. It's his own experience with yeah. it. But yes, it's, it's a that. great, great drill. And I, and I think, so, so there used to be a, and I think it's changing now, this whole, I think that maybe stigma is not the right word, but a thought process of meditation yeah. is just, you know, it's for these tree hugging, <laughs> granola eating <laughs> hippies that live in the woods right. of Northern California. Right. But, but it really is proven today by science, again, biology, not psychology. Yes. That it really does make a make a, a huge difference in your performance and in your mental and physical health. Exactly. And you you're hundred percent right. There is that stigma where, oh, that's not for me. It's it's gonna, it's gonna it's going to conflict with my religion or it's going to conflict with, with my mindset. I'm like, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dog. I'm a killer. I'm a feel. I don't need to do some breathing yeah. technique and to help them to teach them that. No, it's not, it's not going to make you soft is to help you train your mind to put it where you want, when you want, yeah. you want that skill. They're like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a focus attention control drill to help you focus when it matters most. And when you, it's all about the education, how you introduce it. Yeah. And also for some people, it's not breathing. Some people, breathing is not the way, and they show them other ways to do it. Sometimes it's just a, a sounds. Maybe you focus on the sound for a week or for, for a minute or, or 10 minutes. Sometimes you can do mindfulness walking. Sometimes it's in the weight room. Every time you put your hand around a barbell, just be, just feel the feel your hands. There's a, a, a player I'm working with who it's playing catch. 
he plays catch every day. It's feeling the glove on his hand, feeling the ball in his fingers. That's where you be where your feet are, being fully present. And so um, there's another person, they don't like to use the word mindfulness uh, uh, meditation. They call it tactical breathing. <laughs> it sounds cooler. Right. Right, I'm doing. I'm, oh, I'm going to go practice some tactical breathing. Okay, yeah. perfect. If that's what you want to name well, it, that's the name well, of it. Whatever, it sounds right. cool. Yeah, whatever. I love that. And so, 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 let me ask you a question. I, I kind of shifting topics. I could stay on that topic forever, but shifting topics. I, I have. I have a lot of friends. I, I do a lot of running. I run because I'm training for marathons. I ran an ultra last year. I'm running another ultra this year, and so I do a lot of running. And I and I. I have, it's gotten to the point where it really is moving meditation for me. Like yeah. I ran nine miles this morning and it's a great way for me just to clear my mind. And it used to be, I had to run with music playing mm -hmm. in my ears. And now it's, I can, I can run with no music in my ears and kind of just get lost in the, in the miles. So that's a moving meditation for me. But I get asked all the time, like Chad, how do you get so motivated to get up? I get up at four 30 every morning, get up at four 30 every morning and run. For me, it's it's one has been discipline and repetition, discipline and repetition. Now I don't have to think about it, but how do people motivate themselves? I know there's intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation, but if you were coaching somebody, what would be the way to teach somebody to be self-motivated? Yeah, I think that is a, that's the million dollar question. That's such an important question because a lot of people going starting January, a new year, starting a new season, people are driven and motivated to create new habits and new behaviors. And lo and behold, they go back and revert to where they were, where they were when they first started. So I think you brought up a very interesting point. So a couple of uh, principles to start things out. I think there's a, a lot of times people ask, oh, he's so motivated when, or she's so motivated. But the reality is discipline. Discipline will trump motivation. Discipline is something and identifying that the high performance habits you need to have and to know that if you want to be great at what you do and to create these long-term habits, these, these great habits that will, will, will lead to incredible results, you're not always going to feel like it. And so there's going to be a stage of where at first, at first this habit is going to be unbearable and then it's going to be uncomfortable. But if you stick with it, it's going to be unbreakable. And understand that there is that, that, that those phases that you're going to pass through. The next thing, if you, if you look at the research on, on motivation, uh, one theory in particular is called the self-determination theory. Hmm. And, uh, and the researchers are Ryan and Desi, and they're out of, out of Canada. And they say in the question, instead of asking, we always hear coaches and leaders say, hey, how, how do I motivate my people? How do I motivate my kids if I'm a parent? And the better question to ask is, how do I create the environment to where they motivate themselves? Mm. And the three pillars to motivation, according to the research, using their vernacular, is the acronym is CAR, C-A-R. So number one is competence. Basically, you are going to be more motivated when you have a sense of perceived progression. If you see yourself getting better, we see this all the time where people make these health goals and they want, let's just say losing weight. They're working hard, they're eating right, they step on the scale and it's not moving or, or it's going the opposite direction of where they want it to go, whether they're trying to gain weight or lose weight, immediately their motivation, they're like, hey, what's the use? And so perceived progression. I was working once with, uh, with uh, uh, someone who wanted to lose weight and she was using the number on the scale as her progression, mm. uh, her, her barometer of success. And it was not, it was like I just said, it was going the opposite way. So what we ended up doing is saying, oh, and then she stopped going to the gym. She's like, done. Right? So we started doing, instead of measuring that thing, which she has no control over, and she thought she had control over it, but until she took a look, she's like, you know, I don't have control because if I had control, it would, I, it would be dropping. What she did control is how often she went to the gym. And so we, she, end, she ended up identifying going to the gym five days a week, Monday through Friday. She got a blank calendar. And so step number one was never step on a scale again. So that was it. She was done stepping on the scale. And then to put a little X every time she went to the gym, just get to the gym and then you'll figure it out. So she ended up putting an X next to, and then she got hot. She went months and then she went years without stepping on the scale and just X, X just stringing hmm. together, just X's Progr progress. She's like, I have, I have a year streak. She was on fire. And next thing you know, she went to the doctors and she would tell her doctors, hey, don't tell me what my weight is. Ended up telling her, her doctor told her her weight and she ended up crying because it was, she surpassed, she was in the best shape of her life, the right. weight that she initially said that she wanted to get. And it was of the byproduct of 
creating mm. that high performance habit. So number one, competence, a sense of progression. Number two, the A stands for autonomy, a sense of autonomy. It, when we feel forced to do something or we have to do something, we don't want to do it. Uh, I, I, there was, I was working with a teenager one time and his homework for the week was to do something to help your family out without being asked by your mom and dad. And he's like, okay, I'll do that. So he's playing video games and he's playing video games in the kitchen. He looks and he sees the kitchen sink. The dishes need to be washed. So he gets up and he's about to go wash the dishes. This is a 16 year old boy and about to go wash the dishes by himself without being told. That's a miracle. You're right. And uh, so he's about to go do it. And next thing he, he hears is his mom yell down from upstairs, Joey, get off the TV and go wash the dishes now. <laughs> and he tells me, so he was about to go do it. He says he, he not only did he not do, he yelled at his mom, he goes back and he starts playing the video games and he doesn't even wash the dishes until he was forced to way later on. But yeah. I said, you were going to do it. You were about to wash the dishes. What happened? He goes, I was forced to. And that's human behavior. That's just a natural human phenomenon. We are more likely to do something and feel motivated to do something when we are the drivers to our own destiny, when we're in the driver's seat. And so for motivation is, what do you want to do? If you don't feel like being, be, be, if you feel a goal is forced on you, hey, if, if it's not running for you, hey, try something else or go do something else. But you're the author of your own domain. And then the C stands for, uh, the R stands for relatedness relationships? Do you have people around you who are there to motivate you? Do you have people around, not motivate, but to inspire you, who are in this journey with you? Maybe they're not doing it specifically, but is there someone who you could be accountable to and encourage you and cheer you on? Those three things. So if you want to be motivated, in addition to, to identifying the discipline, perceive progress, so competence, are you in control of your own domain? Do you have this autonomy where you get to versus have to? Yeah. And the relatedness. Do you have people around you cheering you on in your corner, pushing you, helping you, encouraging you, inspiring you along the way, even sharing the struggle with you? Those are, mm. are the factors that will help enhance motivation. Man, that's so good. I, I never heard that acronym before, and I absolutely love it. We just finished a goal program with all of our clients. So you know, well over 100 people go through this. And we, we don't even call it goals program. We call it strategic planning for 2020. Oh, right? nice. So individual strategic planning. So we go through this workbook. And I just did it yesterday here in Naples or down in Naples. And I have them free write all these goals. So we're free write. So we have six categories. So we say health. Right? So we were focusing on health. I said, just free write as many things as you possibly. Forget smart goal acronyms. Forget all that. Just free write as many goals as you want. Right? It's extreme of consciousness. So they write all anything you want to achieve in 2020. They write them all down. I said, now, I want you to put next to each one either an OG, right, which stands for outcome goal, or PG for process goal. And it's amazing to me the amount of people that write down outcome goals. Now, they don't know what that means, right? But they, it's I win or lose by achieving this outcome. When the real, what the real goals that we should be setting, and I want to get your take on this, are these process goals because the process goals change what I do, right, which changes the most important thing, which is my self-view, the view about myself, which eventually will change the outcome. But even if you get it, it doesn't matter because I've changed fundamentally who I am. Does that make sense? That makes perfect do, sense. Do, do, do you and agree I with this? I completely agree. I completely agree. Identifying the destination or identifying the OG. I, I love that. With the goal, because a lot of times in, in, in sports in particular, it's so easy to go back to sports. Everyone wants to win the World Series. Everyone right. wants to win the Super Bowl. Everyone wants that bone. Every, every, everyone is saying the exact same goal. And so reverse engineering it to getting right. down to, okay, in order to get to that place, what do you, you in particular, mm -hmm. what habits do you need to develop in order to put yourself in a position to achieve that OG, that outcome goal, that championship? And so yeah. when you take a look at the mirror and say, okay, what high-performance habits do I need to develop? that as I execute those day in and day out, I know it'll put me in the best position to, to be prepared and to pay the price to be able to achieve that, that yeah. goal. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And it's not, it's, and I don't, wanna, I don't wanna say that, hey, it's, it's, it's setting goals, because I'm all about setting goals. Yes. But the, but the outcome goal really is the North Star, you set it, yep. that's the direction, but it's the process and the habits that you need to, the, those goals, those things you need to achieve Will eventually become as I, I talk to people all the time. They 
I just looked at, I did my year review of my personal goals for 2019. And in most of the facets, I became the goal. It wasn't about achieving the goal. I became the goal. I became a healthy person. I became a runner. I became a this. And so running a marathon, that was a fait accompli because I had already become that person. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. I love that. Where you become, yeah, you you become the muse and the thing that's under construction at the same Correct. time. I love it. What a, what yeah. a process. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Perfect. So, all right. So let's, let's kind of, I know we're running out of time, but I want to shift. I, I, I could do this yeah. all, I could do this all, all day. Likewise. Right. So, so what do you, what are the biggest obstacles that stand in people's way to your, so you're this mental health performance coach and there's, there's the st- obstacles and struggles that they have. What's the biggest obstacle and struggle do you think to get somebody to to really let go and get them in this state of flow get them in this the right mindset what's the biggest obstacle that they face or people face yeah i think i I think there's a a couple of things i think there's a couple of things i think the first one going back to what we talked about earlier is just this lack of self-awareness and the research shows that a lot of us a lot of us uh, we think we are a lot more self-aware than we really are and and just not fully understanding what makes them tick what what their sources of confidence are what their source of what their confidence killers are what what helps them be the best version of themselves what are their go-to habits who are their go-to people i think a lot of people don't stop and pause to take a look at themselves and even we evolve we change and to even look at their own why cuz I've seen people's why change from when you're a 20, your why might change from when you're 30, from when you're 40, from when you're 50. To be able to take a look at those things, I think that becomes a huge obstacle right off the bat where people unconsciously just kind of navigate through their day and just kind of do what they do, just going on autopilot without pausing and taking a look and re, re-looking, taking a look in the mirror and just reassessing their goals, their habits, what they want, how they want to be, how they come off to people, how what their stress triggers are. I think that's number one. So just right off the bat, lack of self-awareness. Mm-hmm. And then I think another obstacle that people run into is just this belief that this governor, as, as you mentioned, which I like, is that they can't change. I really believe there are people out there who feel that I, I, I'm just not Chad. I can't be David Goggins. I can't be Gary mm-hmm. Vaynerchuk. I, I'm not that good. And this, this inner belief that, that they feel that they are who they are. They're, they're, they're a finished end product as opposed to subscribing and believing that there's neuroplasticity. Who you are today doesn't have to be who you are next week or the week after. If you have the white belt mentality, you can learn, you can grow, you can evolve. And it's hard and it's difficult and it's going to be a struggle but as you crawl and struggle and climb every day, you're going to see yourself grow. And, it, and, it's, and, and also, it kind of in, in, a, in a kind of a corollary principle to that as well, is people and other obstacles that people think it's going to be a straight line to success as a, without realizing that all the greats go through peaks and valleys. It's very difficult. And that when you run into an obstacle, difficulty doesn't mean that the, that the dream is gone, doesn't mean that you're not capable of achieving it, it's just going to reveal to you how bad you want it. Okay. Yeah. How bad do I want it? Okay. Let's find a way through it, around it, over it, whatever it takes. And so that's the test. Yeah. That's the test. That's the, And then you grow and then you conquer that mountain. And behind that mountain is another mountain <laughs> and then another mountain and right. then another, another mountain. I think that's the big obstacle where people really think that um, it's just smooth sailing when, when it's not. So the whole, I, I, I completely agree in this idea of being self-aware because I think the, the the best of the best, that's one of the differentiating properties is is they are very self aware, yes. and they're self aware in the sense of um, they're they're able to identify where they are on the spectrum. Hey, listen, I'm living up to the best version of myself right now. I'm not living up to the best version of myself. How do how do how do you become? Because I think that's a it really is a, is a and maybe not a mindset, but it's a, maybe it's a habit. Like, how do you become? a master of being self-aware like how do you really focus on being self-aware yes i think there are this and this is there's research done on it there's a great book called insight by tasha yurik or yurik and she's an organizational psychologist and her job is to help ceos 
and leaders become self-aware so that they can lead their organizations at a, at a much higher level. And it's very difficult to do. And I think one principle is to go back to what we discussed earlier is asking yourself more effective questions. Uh, once again, if you want better answers, start asking yourself better questions. Uh, questions like, uh, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Uh, what is my why right now? Who, um, who do I need to strengthen my relationship with? Who do I have a hard relationship with? Why is that? Why right. is that tension there? Just to start and pause. So I think that's number one. I think number two, the great thing about elite performers is they're surrounded by elite coaches. They're surrounded by people who are, are not enamored by how many followers they have. They're not enamored by the multi-million dollar contracts that these athletes have. They could care less. They just care about this athlete so much that they want to help them be better instead of feel better. So when you're around coaches of elite athletes, they're going to hit these athletes as, as decorated as they are and as elite as they are with the truth right between the eyes. And the athletes appreciate that. And the research shows that elite performers would rather have someone give them critical feedback because to help them be better as opposed to somebody saying, oh, you're good, no, you're great. Everyone's doing that to these elite performers. Right. So if you wanna be self-aware, I would identify someone in your life who you value and you know who values you. You go up to that person, you have a notebook out, and you sit down you say, I want to be better in a certain aspect of my life and I'm coming to you because I value your opinion in this domain. I would like you to give me straight up honest feedback. And the reason I chose you is because I know you care about me as a person and I know you value me and I know you want what's best for me and I'm not going to I am not going to defend myself. I'll ask further questions to understand more. Let me have it. Oh my goodness. Get ready. <laughs> I love get that. Ready, oh man. Uh, for for get ready to put your seatbelt on because when you couch it like that and they're able to give you this unadulterated, unfiltered, and and they're gonna be wheezy. They're gonna be kind of like not wheezy, but they're gonna be kind of like go there. Wait, are you sure? Are you ready for this? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready for it. Go ahead. And to thank them afterwards and then to go back. That is an amazing way. And to do that regularly. To oh, just yeah. try that out. I love that. One of the one of the pages in our goal book was. Uh, find that coach, and and I literally have it spelled out there is uh, don't find a coach that's an empathizer. Find one that's a disruptor. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is we find people that empathize with us that they tell us what we want to hear, yes. rather than what we need to hear. Yes, right? exactly. And I love that because a lot of times people are like, oh, I'm going to go to my spouse, or I'm going to go to my mom, I'm going to go to yeah. my dad, and sometimes that's the worst person to go <laughs> to worst. because you're so great. Oh, oh, I love you so much. Oh, and yeah. You need to go to someone who can give yeah. you. I can call my mother right now. I'm like, hey, I think about getting a tattoo on my face and becoming a drug dealer. And she's like, all right, well, listen, just have fun and you know, be safe. And, and, and like, so, so she's an empathizer because right. she loves me so much. Right. But some of Sometimes, right. sometimes it's the people that love us so much that keep us in our comfort zone the exactly. most. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I I love that. Yeah. And that's the way, if you're listening to this, that's worth writing down if you're taking notes on this. <laughs> uh, say that again. I've never yeah. heard it put like that. Yeah, if people love us the most, keep us in our comfort zone the most. I love it. Because they don't they don't want you to get hurt. They don't want yep. you to stretch further out because there's a lot of disappointment in what this perceived disappointment or uh mindset and failing, but you, and you said something in one of your interviews. You said you didn't like um, the expression "I either fail or I, I either win or I learn." Right? I don't and, like and, that. I, and I and I loved. I had never heard this this perspective before. But somebody said to you uh, something to the effect of, "Do you do you like uh, Conor McGregor's uh, book title, his manager, his trainer's book title, which is you either." Either win or you learn or something. Yeah, like yeah. That. But it. you don't like that. You don't subscribe to that. I don't subscribe to that. The reason is I get the concept, but what 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 we are also alluding to the FET point is that you don't learn from winning. So you you <laughs> learn or you learn. A lot of times it's it's very easy after a win to oh we won, brush it under the brush it under the, uh, the carpet and just kind of move on, as opposed to pausing and learning from winning. Winning leaves clues just as much as learning or losing leaves clues mm. and to learn from winning. So, so you win and you lose. And, and also, I also, you're going to lose sometimes. We don't need to sugarcoat it. We don't need it. You lost. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's all right. You, you, you lost. You came in second. You came in lot. You lost. What are we going to learn from it? Okay. You won. What are you going to learn from it? So yeah. you win or you lose and you can learn from both. Yeah. So you yeah. learn, you learn or you learn. You learn and you learn. Yeah, exactly. I love that. I think one of the, one of the things we ask a lot of our clients to do, and which is really hard for a lot of people, 
is to do a a report card after every sale or after every every, every and and they're like, well, Chad, what do you mean? I said, well, listen, you just you just you just sold you just sold a home, you just sold you just sold whatever, you just sold a million dollar item uh, job. So let's do a report card. What did you do really well? What was the obstacles you overcame? What was the like literally a full debrief on what went well? Same thing when you do, when you're losing because now now I have the now I have the recipe card, right? Like it, it, the rest, most people don't have their own recipe cards. Is that right? I, I love that. I rem, as you're saying this, I'm thinking about, I spent some time in the military uh, in this capacity as a, as a, as a, it was my title. It was like, a, our titles were like a mental performance expert or a performance enhancement expert. Yeah. Uh, in the performance enhancement expert with the military, I worked with combat medics. And while I was there, I learned an, an, a really cool acronym, an AAR after action review. So after they did something, they would conduct an after action review. And I saw it happen firsthand. So there was a, there was a, a commanding officer who was teaching his platoon about, or, or I forgot exactly what he, what he was, but he was talking about cleaning his weapon. So he, he gave an instructor an instruction on how to clean your weapon. When it was over, he's like, all right, can I get some feedback on how I taught? And everyone gave him an after action review right there in the moment. He's their boss. And they're like, yeah, you kind of confused us in the beginning. And he's sitting there and he's taking notes. Okay, what do do you think about how he did this and how he explained it? Like, yeah, if you would have put, wrote the steps up instead of just verbalized them, that would help us grasp it more. Okay, good. And he's like, I'll write it down next time. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, this is amazing. This is the boss of this organization who just got done doing a presentation. And these soldiers feels this climate of psychological safety to where they can give their boss critical feedback in the moment and he's taking notes right after the presentation. Mm. I'm like, that's incredible. Yeah. And so that's called an after action review. Elite performers do it as well. After a game or after after a series, the coaches will get together or even a player individual and say, okay, what did I do well? What worked? What didn't? Where was my focus? Certain critical questions so you can run your own algorithms on yourself. So you can run your data set and you can say, oh, every time I do this, I tend to be successful. And so yeah. as you, we're in an algorithm data set world now. Now it's all about analytics and yeah. you can run them on yourself. You can create your own analytics and be able to create this robust data set to know, hey, when I'm doing this thing, oh, the, the, the projection I can forecast I am successful a higher percentage of the time as opposed to when I don't do it. And so I agree yeah, with that. I like I love that. that. AAR. I think AAR, that's, after I think, action review. And, and that and that will lead also to more software. Like that could be a yes, step to software, right? Because right? because now the data, I have the data of when when things go really well. When we win, we tend to celebrate and we don't learn, like we don't dive into the details. Yes. When we lose, we say, all right, what we we feel bad. And then we may sometimes look at fill out a recipe card sometimes but right. th- and that's all dependent on how how bad we feel based on based on the loss right but if but if we like i know the next step i win yes i'm happy but let me do the aar i lose i'm upset but let me do the aar and i do it in the moment and then all of a sudden now i now i can look at the two and go and 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 you talk about it, and i think you may even have a like a real um, this might be one of your real cornerstones is this whole idea of flow and being in this state of just real high performance over a long period of time when we're when we know the data is it easier for us to stay in this state of flow that so flow is such an acute moment a here and now moment it, the more the data the more we, when you ask someone who's in flow even i could even ask you when you're running yeah. when you are running and you talk about how you don't need you you don't have to disassociate you're here fully here I mean, are you thinking, what are you thinking about when you're oh, in flow? I'm not. Right. I'm not. Like, I don't even, I just, last week, last week, exactly. I literally, I set up for an eight mile run and it was the, it was, and I needed to figure out what my pacing was going to be for this marathon coming up. And I got done the eight, I got to eight miles and, and I wasn't, I wasn't, cal- I knew how far I was going only because on the mile marks, my, my watch shakes, like vibrates, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. But I wasn't looking at my pace. I wasn't, right. like, which has never happened. Right. I just ran. And I got to eight miles and I heard it, I felt it eight times buzz. So I stopped and I hit, cause it was an eight mile run. I was in the middle of the woods. I stopped and I looked down. I don't even remember getting the eight miles to be honest with you. Huh. And I looked down and it was the fastest eight miles I'd ever run in my life. And I was like, what, what just happened? You just described it. That is flow. When you are so absorbed in the moment, you're not thinking about, 
analytics. You're not thinking about time. You are literally so absorbed. And so to answer your question, does collecting analytics and collecting your own data and AAR, does it help you get in the zone and stay in there longer? I don't, not necessarily. I don't yeah. think, I don't think it, there, there's a, there's a direct correlation between that, but what it does do is you want to create an environment to where you're more likely to experience the zone. So yeah. you can't force the zone. Uh, Just, you were only there about 10% of the time in performance. It's what you do when you're not in a zone. However, the more data you can collect, the more you understand yourself, you, the more you'll be able to put yourself mm. in a position to be able to sink into it more. I gotcha. I love yeah. that. So then what is, and I, I read a great book, um, Called, I think it was called The Rise of Superman um, yeah. on, on the State yeah. of Flow. I think yeah. that's what was the name yeah. of the book yep. of. Um, and it talks all about being in this state of flow and how these athletes talking about BMX bikers and, yeah. and skateboarders and the state of flow. And so so what is exactly the state of flow? I know like I I have felt it, experienced it in different aspects of my life, some when I'm selling or when I'm speaking. Um, but But what actually is it? Yeah, it is, I would say, flow in – layman's terms very simple is being fully present where you are right here right now like that is that's literally the essence of flow and the components and so mihai cheek sent mihai is the one who's known as the founding researcher of flow and the facets or the components of flow is we we went over br them uh, briefly uh, earlier in this in this episode is uh, uh, distortion of time so you're not aware of time like you just lose track of it. Uh, lack of, of, of self, uh, not self aware, but judge, judgment of others. You do not care what other people think. You don't care who's ahead of you, who's behind you. Am I going to win? Am I going to lose? You don't even care. You're not even, your mind's not even on that. Um, fully present to the task at hand. Someone who's reading a conversation. Um, uh, it could be, it could be a number of different things where you're so involved in the moment. That's where the autotelic part comes in, where the task itself or where the running itself becomes the, the prize as opposed to the destination. Oh, I, when I finish it's when you're in the flow, it's this moment right here is the greatest moment of my life. Mm. Now that that's, that's the experiencing flow. And, and really that's, those are the main components and it, and it's something where you tend to, and, and it's the combination, it's the intersection of your perceived skill level and your perceived challenge. It's that intersection right there where they, where they end up crossing. Because if you have a perceived skill level, let's say you, you feel you're a certain type of runner, a skill, certain skill set. If it's an easy race or an easy terrain, you're not going to experience flow because you're like, oh, my skill set is, is almost boring because my skill set's so high. If you have a certain skill set and you're running a terrain that is just mountains and you don't feel if the challenge is too big, you're going to experience anxiety and a lot of stress. And so as you work on your craft to get your perceived skill set to match your perceived mm. challenge, that's when you're most likely to hit the zone. Love that. Love that. Okay. I don't know. I could literally do this for <laughs> forever. So, so let me just wrap this up. I have, a, I have a couple more questions and let you go. But, but to anybody that's listening right now, anybody that's listening right now, what, what is the number one thing they should take away that they should say, listen, I want to, I want, I know that I now have, I now know what growth mindset is. I now know what flow is. I, I get it. I know how to self-motivate. I, I get all this, but what is some, what should they do right now? What's like, what's the first thing Perfect. they do today Perfect. to start this, this, this journey to, to better be the best version of themselves? Live every day on purpose with purpose. So if you're listening to this, we can see what you love and what you truly value by where you spend your time. That's, that's it. You can say you want to be great. You can say you want to be a great runner. You want to get in shape. Let's look at your time. How much time are you spending doing it? Your time and where you spend your time is the, the key revealer of the things that matter most to you. Mm. And so if I were to identify, if, I, if someone were to hang up the phone and, or, or stop listening to this and, uh, and go and do their next action item, number one, it would be identify. I love your drill. Just what do you want? Just flow. Let it absolutely flow. Step one, just fill up the paper. And you might follow up and tell them how to do that, but yeah. I, I love that exercise. Then number two is pick Pick one or two that just light you on fire, light you on fire where you just think about it. You're like, that yeah. is incredible. Your heart, there's an emotional, visceral relate reaction to it. 
And then to go back to what we said and now reverse engineer, what are the habits you need to create in order to achieve it? And then throughout your day, I would start out with even in the morning. We always talk about this concept, win the morning. Building your first hour and a half on purpose with purpose. When you wake up, instead of dragging yourself out of bed, what do you need to do in the first 90 minutes of your day to, to run your day so your day doesn't run you? We're only given 86,400 seconds a day. That's it. To really identify, okay, what do I need to do in order to achieve that goal? And how, what habits do I need to develop? And I'd start with the morning and do it every single day. Yeah, I yeah. love that, man. I, I'm telling you, I'm a, I'm a big morning guy. Yeah. And, and <laughs> because it's the only time of the day that I own. Nobody, no clients are calling me at 4.30. My kids are still sleeping. My wife is still sleeping. But once they, at six o'clock, my my kids could need me, my work could need me, and that goes all the way until eight or nine o'clock at night. Exactly. Right. So so I own that block of time. And so I love your whole analogy of of own the day. Own yes, the day. And, absolutely. and and live your life on purpose with purpose. That's right? it. And then wake up, and then first thing you should do is listen to his podcast every morning. <laughs> it's a six minute, it's literally six or seven minutes. That's just it, sure. here's a quick topic. Yeah, quick that, that again. Get your starts training your brain in the right, in the right. Yeah. Try to give you a little, uh, a little nudge for the day. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Think about it. you learn one new thing every day. That's it. It's a lot of growth. That's a lot of stuff. All right. So, so obviously, uh, where do people find you? I'm saying obviously, I talked about in the beginning how you're on on social media, but if people wanted to follow you, get more of you. Where do they find you? Yeah, uh, Instagram uh, and Twitter at Justin Sua, J U S T I N S U A, and then my podcast. Increase your impact podcast. I'm, yeah. I'm dabbling yeah. in LinkedIn right now, so we're uh, yeah, big. we're in LinkedIn. LinkedIn. I, that's what I hear. LinkedIn so, is, uh, is LinkedIn so, uh, is big. So you'll find you can find me on there as well. Yeah, perfect. Listen, uh, make sure you download the podcast, subscribe to it, rate it, review it, because that that obviously pushes up to more people and improves your contribution. So that. really, really thank you thank for being you so here. Much. I'm gonna come. You, I, I don't know. Do you travel with the Rays? Do you go? I on do. Road? I do. So you'll be in Baltimore. I'll with, be in Baltimore. Yep. I'm calling I'll you when they there. come to Baltimore. <laughs> okay. Right? It's easy to get tickets to that game because <laughs> okay, there's only like five thousand right. people at every game. <laughs> sounds great. But uh, I'm coming when when we play. Okay. You. That All sounds right. great. <laughs> awesome. Listen, uh, if you don't follow him, make sure you follow him. Last question for the day. I ask every every podcast to uh, guess this question, and that is. When you leave this earth 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years from now, whenever you leave this earth, uh, what do you want your contribution to have been? What do I want my contribution to have been? My hope, my contribution is to help people realize that, I think going back to what we were talking about, is that they can make a difference themselves. You can make a difference in your home, you can make a difference in your, a positive difference in your house, a positive difference at work, and that it's in you. Like, it's not reserved for special people in the world. You can make a positive difference. And it's the little things that you do, uh, treating people kindly, being respect, being kind, and, and being, being kind to yourself. And so I hope that when I'm gone, people will say, hey, Justin was, a good, was good at reminding us of those things. I, I hope I, people remember me as, as a reminderer. I just mm -hmm. reminded people. That's all I do is I remind people mm -hmm. of, of simple principles to help them be the best versions of themselves. Mm. Drop the mic. Drop the mic. Check the guy out. Follow him. And uh, if you like this podcast, make sure you review it, rate it, review it, share it with everybody because Justin's words are uh, powerful stuff. Thank Thanks, you. man. Appreciate it, brother.